Hi, how are you? Are you ready for... Boom, boom. Our next part of our read-along of A Wizard of Earthsea by Ursula K. Le Guin. You ready for that? Because I am. If you remember last time, uh, Ged was helping to, or trying, to heal a sick child. But the sick child had gone into, what what do they call it, the shadow, the afterlife, the other side, anyway. And Ged followed, didn't he? And then he thought, oh my gosh, I can't get back. So he turned around to look and there was someone else standing where he should have been on on the world, on the light side. So my question was, is he trapped in here? And this thing is going to be him, like some kind of doppelganger? Who knows? Shall we find out? Let's do it. Either he must go down the hill into the desert lands and lightless cities of the dead, or he must step across the wall back into life where the formless evil thing waited for him. Yikes. His spirit staff was in his hand and he raised it high. With that motion, strength came into him. As he made to leap the low wall of stones straight at the shadow, the staff burned suddenly white, a blinding light in the dim place. He leapt, felt himself fall and saw no more. Now that Peck Vary and his wife and the witch saw was the... Now, what Peck Vary and his wife and the witch saw was this... The young wizard had stopped midway in his spell and held the child a while motionless. Then he had laid little Ioweth gently down on the pallet and had risen and stood silent, staff in hand. All at once he raised the staff high and it blazed with white fire as if he held the lightning bolt in his grip. And all the household things in the hut leapt out strange and vivid in that momentary fire. When their eyes were clear from the dazzlement, they saw the young man lying huddled forward on the earthen floor beside the pallet where the child lay dead. To Peck Vary, it seemed that the wizard also was dead. His wife wept, but was utterly bewildered. But the witch had some hearsay knowledge concerning Majory and the ways a true wizard may go, and she saw to it that Ged, cold and lifeless as he lay, was not treated as a dead man but as one sick or tranced. He was carried home and an old woman was left to watch to see whether he slept to wake or slept forever. The little attack was hiding in the rafters of the house, as it did when strangers entered. There it stayed while the rain beat on the walls and the fire sank down and the night, wearing slowly along, left the old woman nodding beside the hearth pit. Then the attack crept down and came to Ged, where he lay stretched stiff and still upon the bed. It began to lick his hands and wrists, long and patiently with its dry, leaf-brown tongue. Crouching beside his head, it licked his temple, his scarred cheek, and softly closed his eyes. And very slowly, under that soft touch, Ged roused. He woke, not knowing where he had been, or where he was, or what was the faint grey light in the air about him, which was the light of dawn coming into the world. Then the Otak curled up near his shoulder as usual, and fell asleep. Later, when Ged thought back upon that night, he knew that it he knew that had none touched him when he lay, thus spirit lost, had none called him back in some way, he might have been lost for good. It was only the dumb instinctive wisdom of the beast who licks his hurt companion to comfort him, and yet in that wisdom Ged saw something akin to his own power, something that went as deep as wizardry. From that time forth, he believed that the wise man is one who never sets himself apart from other living things, whether they have speech or not, and in later years, he strove long to learn what can be learned. In silence, from the eyes of animals, the flight of birds, the great slow gestures of trees. <clears throat> He had now made unscathed for the first time that crossing over and return which only a wizard can make with open eyes, and which not the greatest mage can make without risk. But he had returned to a grief and a fear. The grief was for his friend Pegvari, the fear was for himself. He knew now why the archmage had sent 
had feared to send him forth, and what had darkened and clouded even the major's foreseeing of his future, for it was darkness itself that had awaited him, the unnamed thing, that being that didn't belong in the world, the shadow he had loosed or made. In spirit, at the boundary wall between death and life, it had waited for him these long years. It had found him there at last. It would be on his track now, seeking to draw near to him, to take his strength into itself and suck up his life and clothe itself in his flesh. Soon after he dreamed of the thing like a bear with no head or face, he thought it went fumbling about the walls of the house, searching for the door. Such a dream he had not dreamed since the healing of the wounds the thing had given him in the first place. When he woke he was weak and cold and the scars on his face and shoulder drew and ached. Now began a bad time. When he dreamed of the shadow or so much as thought about it, he always felt that some cold, dread, sense and power had drained out of him, leaving him stupid and astray. He raged at his cowardice, but that did no good. He sought for some protection, but there was none. The thing was not flesh. It wasn't alive, not spirit, unnamed, having no being but what he himself had given it. A terrible power outside the laws of the sunlit world. All he knew of it was that it was drawn to him and would try to work its will through him, being his creature. But in what form it could come, having no real form of its own as yet, and how it would come and when it would come, these things he did not know. He set up what barriers of sorcery he could about his house and about the isle where he lived. Such spell walls must be ever renewed, and soon he saw that if he spent all of his strength on these defences, he would be of no use to the islanders. What could he do between two enemies if a dragon came from Pendor? Again he dreamed, but this time in the dream the shadow was inside his house, beside the door, reaching out to him through the darkness and whispering words that he did not understand. He woke in terror and sent the werelight flaming through the air, lighting every corner of the little house till he saw no shadow anywhere. Then he put wood on the coals of his fire pit and sat in the firelight, hearing the autumn wind fingering at the thatch roof and whining in the great bare trees above. And he pondered long, and old anger had awakened in his heart. He would not suffer this helpless waiting, this sitting trapped on a little island, muttering useless spells of lock and ward. Yet he could not simply flee this trap. To do so would be to break his trust with the islanders and to leave them with the imminent dragon undefended. There was but one way to take. The next morning he went down among the fishermen to the principal moorage of Low Tawning, and finding the head isleman there said to him, I must leave this place. I am in danger, and I put you all in danger. I must go. Therefore, I ask your leave to go out and do away with the dragons on Pendor so that my task for you will be finished and I may leave freely. Or, if I fail, I should fail also when they come here, and that is better known now than later. The Isle Man stared at him all drop jawed. Lord Sparrow Hork, he said, there are nine dragons out there. Eight of them are still young, they say. But that old one, I tell ye, I must go from here. I ask your leave to rid you of the dragon peril first, if I can do so. As you will, sir, said the Isle Man gloomily. All that listened there thought this a folly or a crazy courage in their young wizard, and with sullen faces they saw him go, expecting no news of him again. Some hinted that he meant merely to sail back by Hosk to the inmost sea, leaving them in the lurch. Others, among them Pegvari, held that he had gone mad and sought death. Gosh. Do you think he's going to do it? He's out to get rid of the dragons. Eight, nine dragons. Eight of them young, one of them old. Mm, he gonna have to do some good wizarding. So, how has your day been? It's been all right. Uh, I went into work this morning. This work, this school here. Uh, and just 
like got some stuff together really uh, then I've moved a bookshelf from the boys room into this room so I've got not all of my books maybe the majority of my fiction books I've now got in here don't know whether I like it or not though I like seeing my books because normally they're all kept just slung in a wardrobe but it's nice to have them on display but I feel like I might need some more shelves <laughs> And I've got all of my non-fiction books just down here. Like I've got a drawer under the bed and there are gazillions under there. I, they're the ones I want to have on show. But, yeah, no, beggars can be choosers and all that. But yeah, so um, basically the boys are in a bunk bed. And with Bo being 13 and Floyd being 10, and they are tall, big boys. Um, it's Yeah, it's time like they're still going to have to share a room. But I'm gonna, I can't have them in bunk beds anymore. So bless them, they've got two like kind of like half bunk beds. So that's what we're going to have to do. Uh, yeah, anything else I can tell you about? Not really, it's another lovely day outside. Really stiflingly hot in here again. <sighs> I tell you. Um, but yeah, nothing really exciting has happened today. Uh, nope. No, nothing exciting to tell you, I'm afraid. But I, I, what I might do is have a bit of a, a face trim up tonight. Look at that, look. That's, that's really long. Look at that. And also, even my hair. Look, look how long that is now. It comes right down to the end of my nose. My glasses went there. No. You see that? Look. Gosh. Hello. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I won't do my own hair, but I might get rid of some tufts off of there for a little while just to see if it helps make me feel a little bit cooler anyway that's as much excitement as i'm going to tell you about tonight and i'll see you all tomorrow for more excitement night